Right. You guys ready to go ahead and get started? It's a big rousing crowd here. I'm gonna turn a little bit. Is that okay with you, Lauren? Okay. I just feel weird like facing that way when you guys are sitting over here. So my name is Carly Prippet. I am a family physician by training and still have a primary care practice here at the University of Utah, but I also see patients in our headache clinic um, a couple times a month. So I'm here to talk to you today about contraception and migraine in particular. Not sure how applicable this may be to you, sir, but happy to, um, happy to talk about this. Uh, I intend this to be really quite casual. You can see I don't have slides, I have some props. Um, so please ask questions. I want this to be as interactive and useful um, as it can be for you. Uh, the most important things I really wanted to hit in thinking about this were um, uh, there are some times when contraception is imperative in um, people who have migraine. So number one, um, there are some of the medications that we use that are not safe in pregnancy. So ensuring that a woman has effective contraception in place when you're using certain types of medications is really important because you don't want to cause any um, damage to a developing fetus. So especially some of the anti-seizure drugs in this category um, are the ones that first come to mind for me. So I try when I'm talking to women of childbearing age to make sure I always bring this up um, to find out if they're thinking about getting pregnant, what, what are they using for contraception uh, currently, and um, what are their plans for pregnancy, because that impacts uh, not only the medications we use, but also their headaches in general. So we, know that the, we know that those can change with pregnancy to a degree. Um, the other thing I wanted to make sure to address is that uh, we talked, you guys uh, have talked about migraines before. Thank you for doing that. Okay, most birth control pills, when we're thinking about them, can contain two types of hormones, so estrogen and progesterone. There are a handful of options that are progesterone only. There's a pill formulation that's progesterone only. Um, it's not always my first choice for people because it's a little bit persnickety, so you have to take this pill within, like around the same time every day, really within like two hours of the same time. So if you take it at eight o'clock every morning, you gotta take it at eight o'clock every morning. A, um, that window of two hours, if you're past that, it's not as effective in terms of contraception. This is just a progesterone only. So I don't know about you guys, I don't think taking a pill every day is very easy, and especially something like that where you have to be that specific and take it at the same time every day. So I'll often encourage women, or at least educate them about other options. So your other progesterone only options are things like um, the Depo-Provera shot. So that's a shot that you do once every three months. Uh, there, um, the others are what we consider a long-acting reversible contraceptive or a LARC, you'll sometimes hear it called. So there's one that's an um, implantable rod in the arm that's called a Nexplanon. That's good for three years. I'll pass around this little fake arm. You can actually feel the Nexplanon in there. Um, with all of these, with this or the IUDs that I'm going to talk about next, you don't actually have to keep it in for the full three years. So if you try it for three years, or like you try it for three months and you don't like it, 
you can take it out. You're not obligated to it for the full time. Um, the other really popular option is an IUD. So these are, these are practice IUDs or trainer IUDs, um, but just so you can see sort of what they look like. The IUD itself is um, relatively small. I think some people think it's gonna be a little bit bigger than that. A woman's uterus is about the size of your fist. So you can see this just sits in the uterus that way um, and goes uh, up at the top of the uterus. These are both in office procedures that can be done. And like I said, these, um, these contain estrogen. This is a little fake uterus to give you an idea of what it looks like. And this is a copper IUD. So this is a different type of, type of IUD that actually has no hormone at all. So for some people who feel particularly sensitive to hormones, this might be another option. Um, some of the biggest differences between these two as a patient and as like counseling when I talk about them is um, the progesterone IUDs, there's a handful of them. One thing that's really nice is um, that typically by about two years of use, about two thirds of women don't have their period at all. So when given the option for most of us to have your period or not, uh, it's pretty nice to not have it. So that's kind of nice. Um, with the progesterone formulations, one of the, um, I don't know if I want to call it a side effect necessarily, but one of the things that can happen is irregular bleeding. So with the Nexplanon or even with um, one of the progesterone IUDs. And for some people that's just, that's not tolerable and not desirable. So hard to know what's going to happen. I usually try to tell people to take it, to try to stay with whatever your birth control is for three months to give your body some time to adjust. With the copper IUD, um, it tends to give women heavier periods. So that's one potential drawback to this. Um, it does provide a longer window of contraception. So the copper IUD, um, it's called the Paragard, actually lasts for 10 years. So you can keep this in for up to 10 years. Um, and uh, in Europe, they'll actually let you keep it in for 12. With the, um, a couple of the uh, progesterone IUDs, the longest length of time is five years. Although in Europe, they'll actually let you keep it in for seven. So for someone, if you, um, particularly before birth control was covered by insurance, if you were gonna lose your insurance, like this was a really great option for people. Some people just always find reassurance in having their period every month, right? They know they're not pregnant, they feel good about it. I have a patient who has a Mirena that she really likes the progesterone IUD. She doesn't have her period at all. She actually takes a pregnancy test every month because it just sort of freaks her out because she thinks she might be pregnant. Um, so something else to keep in mind, like some people actually, like I said, find that reassuring to have their period every month. So that's some about um, progesterone only and options of no hormone in general. Um, I'll pass those around as well. Is Sprintac, is that the progesterone only? Uh, Sprintac, I'm not as good with the brand names. We usually call it, um, uh, it's usually Norgestimate is the um, other name. Um, if you look on the pill pack, it, if it just has a single, it's usually 0.35 is the progesterone dose. If it has like, two numbers like 1.25 and um, or like it to see the, the the estrogen dose is usually anywhere from 0.25 to 0.5 and then a, like a slash and then an, another number that lets you know there's two hormones in it um uh, the other thing i was going to talk about is um for some women your period in general is a trigger so there's a couple of things that will happen in the menstrual cycle that can be a trigger for women with their periods so sometimes it's ovulation which typically happens mid-cycle for women it can be um, having your period it can be the start of your period it can be the middle of your period it can be right as you're sort of finishing those can be triggers for women as well so sometimes we'll try to manipulate um, a woman's menstrual cycle such that you don't have a period at all. So we can't reliably do that with the progesterone only options, although um, that's one of the things we're trying to do is to not give a woman their period so that then you don't get that um, cyclical nature to it. Uh, the other thing we can do if a woman doesn't have a contraindication to estrogen is actually do what we call continuously cycling. So have you guys all seen a birth control pill pack before? So there's you know, the three weeks of pills that look the same and then that last week of pills. That last week of pills is what we call the placebo week or, or sugar pills. Like there is no active hormone in it. Um, we have women do that just so you get in the habit of taking a pill every day. And you know, if you took a pill for three weeks and then not for a week, you're just more likely to get off track. So um, another thing we can do is just have women skip that what we call placebo week and then immediately start the next pack. Um, the biggest drawback to this is sometimes you'll get what we call breakthrough bleeding or just some spotting in the mid-cycle just because that lining of your uterus is unstable. So sometimes you may have to have a period every couple of months or so and that's a bit of um, 
you just have to try and trial and error. Like some people do really well with that. Some people spot the whole time and they're like, I'd rather just have my period and be done, even if I'm kind of miserable that way. So those are some of the options hormonally, I would say, um, with, with migraines uh, and contraception in general. What was the problem with estrogen in particular? So estrogen we know increases your risk of stroke. So in a woman who also has aura, it's thought that the two together are too high of a risk. And I would argue that because we have other options available, um, I don't really feel like there's a good reason to use estrogen. I've had people argue against that, that it's a relatively low risk. But I think if you start, if you think about like stacking the deck, right? So say you're a woman with aura, you're on an estrogen containing birth control, we live here at elevation, so that puts us at a little bit higher risk. Maybe you're really dehydrated, so your blood maybe isn't like, I don't really want to say it's thicker per se, but just think it's not flowing quite as well as it should. And then maybe you go hiking or you go skiing, you're doing all these things to sort of increase your risk of stroke. Um, that if there's one of those we could modify, which would be not doing estrogen, that would be the ideal thing to do. So people who have aura, mm -hmm. aura, aura is higher risk migraine or a higher risk for stroke. That's correct. That is correct. Mm -hmm. And I will say there's a lot of people who use birth control, not just for contraception. So um, I actually, in patients that I see, if they have an aura, I will put estrogen in as an allergy in our electronic medical record system, because then if you try to prescribe something with estrogen, the system will actually flag you, just like it would for any allergy, just as a catch in the system. You know, dermatology uses a lot of birth control for um, acne, because uh, combined hormonal contraceptives work really well for acne, and they may not think to ask someone about migraine with aura. Um, so I usually, I, I try to make sure I make this pretty clear with people um, so that they know that it's, it's not a true allergy per se, it's just a contraindication. And I'm doing that to help them so that um, they don't unintentionally get estrogen from someone, that they shouldn't get it. The thought with the migraines that happen um, cyclically, so around the menstrual cycle, when, if you look at the hormone levels in women um, during that week of menses or a woman's period, your estrogen levels actually drop a little bit. So there's some thought that this might be what's contributing to the migraines, and hence why if you do a continuous dose, so if we continuously cycle, that tends to do a little bit better for women because we don't get that sudden drop either naturally or um, artificially <coughs> with birth control. So that's the thought behind trying to do something like that. Um, there's another, so most birth controls are what we call monophasic, meaning that the amount of hormone in every pill is the same, with the exception of that placebo week where there are no hormones at all. Uh, for a while it was pretty popular that there were um, biphasic or triphasic pills. So orthotricycline is one that was marketed that may sound familiar to you. And that was a slightly different hormone level in each of the weeks in an attempt to mimic a more natural cycle um, I feel like unless someone comes to me and they're like, I've been on this for years and it works really well, that's like the only way I will continue it. Um, for a lot of people with migraines, maybe you were put on it because it was what was popular, or it was what you asked for, like who knows, but if that's what you were on, sometimes just changing to a monophasic can make all the difference. Um, we talked a lot about women with aura. Um, for some women who don't have aura, just taking away that estrogen can be helpful, not always. So sometimes trying a progesterone-only formulation can be beneficial. Um, maybe it's because there's less estrogen, maybe it's because you're not having a period, hard to know exactly, and I'm not usually gonna argue with success if it's being helpful. I don't know that we need to pick apart why. So how studied has that been? Like, it, like how well controlled in studies has that been? Good question. I don't know that I could cite the, any specific studies for you. I know that um, there, there's data to support doing things like continuously cycling. Uh, for some women, even just doing a little bit of estrogen during that week, like maybe they don't want to be on birth control, but giving them just a low dose of estrogen during the week of their period, there are recommendations for things like that. So that has some data behind it. How robust those studies were, I couldn't tell you necessarily. Um, I don't know that you ever really want to hear someone say, in my experience, but I would say, in my experience, those are the things that tend to be the most helpful for people. With birth control in general, I think sometimes providers, women, we sometimes have unrealistic expectations of what you want, right? I have a lot of women who are like, well, I just don't want my period at all. 
I can't really guarantee that to happen in any setting. Um, so I think making sure you make the expectations upfront about what this can do, what we're hoping it will do, um, and things to watch for, and also just giving stuff time. So it takes about three months for your body to sort of re-equilibrate. I mean, same thing if you have something funky happen with your period. I'll usually tell people, let's wait and see what happens with your next cycle, because you just want to see if something is a pattern. Um, none of us, patience is not always the best when you're not feeling well. So it's sometimes just hard to get people to buy in. If they're like, well, I had this really awful month and you changed my birth control. I, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. That's what made it worse. I don't know that we could really say cause and effect in those ways. Mm -hmm. Good question. I'm sorry, I can't answer it better than that. But mm -hmm. other questions? isn't uh, necessarily birth control related, but <laughs> would a man with aura be at a higher risk for stroke? Yeah, good question. So would a man with aura be at a higher risk of stroke? And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. So we don't typically give men estrogen necessarily, unless this is someone who's interested um, in transitioning to present themselves as a woman and would like to be on estrogen. Um, but that would be a case where I wouldn't be particularly comfortable doing that. I mean, I'll tell you, I'll have some OBs who will say, oh, no, you're fine to do estrogen. It's an overall low risk. Like I said, I think I just, I tend to be a little bit more risk averse by nature. Um, and that if we could do something different, why not try it and see if it works? Any questions about those different types of birth control or about procedures to put them in or anything like that? Um, in terms of progesterone only birth control, what are the more common signs? Trial and error, yeah. which ones cause weight gain, which ones can yeah. cause X, Y, or Z. Yeah, so there's good, so about what are the side effects of the progesterone only birth controls. Mm -hmm. The only, um, so a lot of people will talk about weight gain with all birth controls, like sort of all cause. Actually, the only form of birth control that has good data to support weight gain is Depo-Provera. So um, that's one of the side effects that can happen with that. Long-term use of Depo, so more than two years, can cause osteoporosis. Um, if you stop it in people, it will go away. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case with any of the other, uh, the other progesterone-only formulations. I would say the biggest side effects are the irregular bleeding for people. That can just be really frustrating to have a little bit of spotting every day all the time. And I would say that's the most common reason I see for discontinuation of the IUD or the Nexplanon. Um, and there's no rhyme or reason. I've had people who've had an IUD and had spotting and hated it and did an Explanon and did fine, and then people who've done the exact opposite, um, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me pharmacokinetically, but I'm not gonna, like I said, I'm not gonna argue with success. Um, the other side effect that I've seen with the progesterone only is acne. So just a little bit, especially um, people will complain about like chest acne and back acne that maybe they didn't have before in addition to just sort of general face acne. So it can be kind of frustrating. Again, doesn't happen for everyone. And there are, I mean, I hate to do like another drug to combat the side effects of that drug, but there are things that can be done about it that can make it a little bit better. Are you more comfortable doing an uh, estrogen-containing IUD in somebody with migraine with aura? So there are no estrogen-containing IUDs. Uh -huh. Yep, so that's a great question. Yeah, all of the IUDs, at least in the United States, so I can't speak to other countries, um, all the IUDs we have available are either no hormone at all, uh -huh. so the copper is no hormone at all. And I think right now, we're up to three or four progesterone only um, IUDs. So some of the newer, so Mirena is the one that's been around the longest. You may or may not have seen ads for that um, on TV or in magazines. There's a couple of new ones um, that are a tiny bit smaller. And like, I can show you, they're really not actually that much smaller, but the thought is for women who've never had a baby before that it might be a little bit easier to put in an IUD. Um, I will tell you, I have put in more IUDs in women who have not had a baby than those who have, and I have only ever put in one of these smaller IUDs. When the smaller ones first came out, they were actually only good for three years, um, and I could usually talk most people into doing the Mirena for five years, because most people, they're like, oh wait, five years has happened? So I think about if you wanted 15 years of contraception, it would be going through this procedure three times versus five. So I think just adding more risks over time 
Um, there is one of the newer ones that is smaller. Um, the smaller ones have a little bit less hormone in them, so I see that as potentially more breakthrough bleeding, um, more side effects that way. So if someone has their heart set on one of the smaller ones, I'll do it, but from like a technical standpoint of doing it, I've only actually had to use the smaller um, IUD once. So uh, these are on my name badge because this is how much I talk about that. So you can just see the difference in size. Oh, yeah, like they're really pretty um, inconsequentially smaller. The the loading device, which is what got passed around with that, is a little bit smaller on the smaller IUDs. So maybe yeah. that's a little bit technically easier to do. Uh, but I don't. I wouldn't tell you that I find it to be a big challenge that way. You had to use the smaller one because they requested it or because their service was like. Um, I just small. I couldn't. So this is pretty bendy yeah. right to get in and when I was trying to put it in it just kept bending on me so I put it in with the device that we use to measure how long your uterus is and I just couldn't pass both of them through the cervix but I could with the smaller one so that's why I elected to do that um, there used to be a pretty common misconception that uh, to get an IUD you had to have had a baby before you have to be in a monogamous relationship and I would say those myths are still pervasive so um, unfortunately, so uh, th those are not true. So actually in adolescence, these long acting reversible contraceptions are the contraception of choice. So an explanon or an IUD. So not to say that adolescents are not monogamous, um, but uh, I think that gives you some indication of their safety. Uh, we used to think that if you got some sort of sexually transmitted infection like chlamydia or gonorrhea, that immediately you would have to pull out the IUD and then do treatment. Now you can actually keep the IUD in, do treatment only if their symptoms don't improve or things get worse, you actually have to take out the IUD. So I think our thinking has come a long way and our understanding about them, um, but unfortunately that doesn't always translate to practicing physicians. So um, I feel like, so I'm not accepting new patients as primary care, but often you know we'll see patients here in headache clinic and they'll need to go on a progesterone only formulation and we'll tell them that and they'll get pushed back from their primary care provider. So then like my colleagues will come to me and be like, so can you just put an IUD in her and then we can be done with this or can we just do this and be done? And I'll be like, yeah, sure, I'm totally happy to. Um, so I don't really know how to, how to dispel that for people, but those aren't contraindications or reasons to not do an IUD. Some people don't like the idea of a foreign body inside of them. Um, so IUDs for that reason may not be super popular. The next one on is nice because you can feel it. So it's put in the non-dominant arm. So like I'm right-handed, it's about like here in the middle of the arm. You can't really, I've had some women who have just super slender arms um, and you can sort of see it like if they turn or do something, but it's intended to be that you can feel it. So I don't know if you guys remember the Norplant that was around a few years ago more than a few years ago at this point. It was good for seven years. It was like much deeper. You couldn't palpate it. Um, and so there were issues with getting it out. This one is much nicer that way. Um, you can always feel it. And if not, you can sort of like push one end of it to kind of like tip it up against the skin because it's just in that subcutaneous. And it actually has a little um, a radio opaque uh, substance within it. So if for some reason you couldn't feel it, you could do an x-ray and show that it was in the right location or just find it basically. So next one on is it just is a slow release of progesterone mm -hmm. um, and same thing should sh should make shorter lighter periods no periods at all but it could also cause irregular bleeding okay. sort of hard to know. My sort of informal poll like when I see women for their annual visits to do a pap smear or other things with their um, who have an IUD I will ask most of them like so tell me do you have do you have a period yeah. what and most of them say no they don't have it at all. After putting the after putting the marina in the marina has just been around for longer so that's the one I will ask about more um, but I would say a lot of people with most people who like these like I feel like with depo, with a lot of these, there's um, people are very polarized on one side or the other. They either love them or they hate them. Yeah. The people who love them typically don't have their periods at all. The people who hate them had really irregular bleeding, had bad acne. Um, sometimes if a woman's never had a baby, the IUD can just be a little more crampy yeah. than women who've had a baby before just because yeah. there's a foreign body in your uterus and that can be a little bit more uncomfortable, sometimes either during sex or like during a period, maybe cramping is a little bit more intense than it was before. Um, those are, yeah, those are some of the side effects I would say that I see with them. Mm -hmm. Other questions? These are good questions. I 
No, I wouldn't say that the progesterone only we, is not any um, less covered by insurance. The most common time we see it is after breastfeeding um, or after delivery when breastfeeding. So estrogen can reduce your milk supply a little bit. Um, and there's, you have a higher risk of having a blood clot when you're pregnant as well. So in that six weeks immediately after having a baby, we still sort of consider you like in the pregnant state just in terms of like what your hormones are doing. So another reason, even if you weren't breastfeeding, sometimes we'll avoid doing a, um, an estrogen containing birth control. Uh, so that's when you see it the most used is, uh, we'll sometimes call it the mini pill. Um, and that's what's given to women so that they, uh, to help to help make breastfeeding hopefully a little easier or do something to not make it more challenging for them than anything else. So breastfeeding we know is also a bit of a contraceptive because you tend to not have your period. So the two together make it a little bit better in that time frame as well to be used. But I have some patients who that's just their preference. They don't want a foreign body in them. And as long as they understand the risks of, you know, this is something you have to be really good about taking all the time. Yeah, exactly. So I know it's not a very easy thing to do. So. I try to not relegate people to it unless they're really committed and that's what they want to do. And some people are great at it. I mean, I have some people who that's what they use and that's their preference. So, or um, I can think of a patient of mine who's actually had her tubes tied, so she's not really using it for contraception, but does a really good job to control her periods and um, keep her migraines under good control. So as long as it's mostly that, just understanding what are you using it for? Is it for contraception? Is it to control periods? Is it to try to help with migraines? And then what are sort of the subtleties within each of those things to make it better or worse? Which, which increases the, the risk of stroke more? The taking of the estrogen-based uh, contraception or the migraine itself? Oh, that's a good question. I would have to look to give you the specific numbers of the two. And I'm trying to think of um, the studies that I've read where they talk about it. They mostly just sort of kept layering on top of it. So it's like, what was the baseline risk of stroke um, in the general population without aura or without migraine or with aura? What is the increase if you have migraine with aura? Um, what is the increase with, oh, I guess that is in the numbers of there. I couldn't have it on a slide on my computer, but I couldn't tell you the numbers off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just that the two together are thought to raise it too much. Mm -hmm. Should people with migraine be concerned about uh, alter, you know, altering lifestyle uh, activity that would lend itself? Yeah, so some of the things we'll talk about in the headache clinic in terms of stroke risk and migraine, particularly with aura, um, we'll talk about taking a baby aspirin or aspirin 81 milligrams every day to try to minimize your stroke risk. And at a minimum, thinking about doing that, especially when you go up to elevation. So if you're going skiing, if you're going hiking, something like that, like those might be days to especially take um, the aspirin and just making sure you do a good job staying hydrated. So again, just trying to modify those risks that are in your control as much as you can, because clearly you can't will ourselves to not have migraine with aura or you know something like that. So those that we can control, we try as best we can. Mm -hmm. yeah, interesting. Yeah. 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 Um, thinking about the estrogen, a lot of women will talk about that their migraines usually start around puberty. So that's just sort of if you think about that, that's the onset of when those hormones tend to be a little bit more prevalent in the system. And typically for most women, migraines actually get better post menopause. So again, just less of that estrogen sort of circulating around. Um, same with pregnancy. Uh, although there, although I talked about you are a little bit higher risk of stroke in pregnancy, there's still just relatively less estrogen in general. So most women will describe that their migraines get better in pregnancy. Again, these are not absolutes, but I will say things that do happen. Um, even if you only have that, like maybe you have, you have migraines without aura, that's your more predominant migraine, and you only have migraine with aura a couple times a year, I would still sort of put you in that category of not using estrogen. This is something that then would continue post-menopause. So even if you're not really having migraines anymore or you're not having aura anymore, if you have that history of having them in the past, we'll sometimes use estrogen after menopause to help with um, a lot of the symptoms of menopause, especially hot flashes and just that sort of flushing. The estrogen is what's really helpful with those symptoms. You don't, you don't wanna do that in people who have aura. Um, there's a couple of other natural herbal supplements that have um, 
what we call phytoestrogens or estrogens from plant sources. So soy is a known phytoestrogen and then black, black cohosh is another supplement. Still estrogens, like even though it's a natural source, still estrogen, not to be, not to be used, not recommended. So just to think a little bit past that like childbearing realm of ages. You can keep, so for women who have migraine with aura who get pregnant, how long should you have them stay on the baby aspirin? It's, it's actually okay to do a baby aspirin throughout pregnancy. Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at bottles, they'll tell you not to take it. Um, we had done some studies here at the U, I mostly remember the advertisements for them. I don't know if they've been written up yet, but about women who had um, pregnancy losses, so more than two pregnancy losses, and sort of randomizing them to a group to take baby aspirin every day. So it's an okay thing to be taking, not not commonly known or advertised, I would say, but would be a reasonable thing to keep doing in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Is it known what it is about the aura migraine that, caught, that increases the risk of, of uh, stroke? Uh, I don't personally know specifically, and I don't know if they have all the chemical pathways worked out. Um, so I guess I can't answer that specifically about what is it about aura in particular. I mean, I think it's thought to be some sort of a, you know, vascular phenomenon that makes this happen. And that's sort of then correlated with why it's a bit of a higher risk. We do just have a higher rate of aura in general here in Utah, which I think is why we talk about this a lot more. Um, so one of our uh, previous uh, providers who was getting his extra training and headache here, um, we were, like one of our colleagues had noticed this as a clinician. She was like, man, I just, I feel like I see a lot of aura, like more than what we say we should see. So he reached out to a colleague at um, a headache clinic that was at sea level and looked at the comparative rates at a headache clinic where we should know what we're, you know, if we're gonna diagnose you with aura, like we should feel pretty confident about that as a diagnosis. And at the headache clinic at sea level, they saw somewhere around like 20 to 30% of people with aura, which is about what you would expect. And we saw closer to 60% here. So it's something I always ask people about because it's not something people volunteer. And I always, when I talk to my colleagues in primary care, I you know, say, don't say to a patient, so tell me, do you have aura with your migraine? Because everyone has a little bit different understanding of what that means. So asking people about, do you ever get any symptoms like funny spots, dots, squiggles in your eyes, hot flashes, something, or like heat wave type stuff that you get that lets you know you're gonna get a migraine? Or you do, do you get any you know, numbness, tingling, like almost like features of a stroke when you get a migraine? We kind of lump all of those together in that category of aura, just because of the increased risk with all of those. Other questions? So is that been replicated? I'm just curious to know. Still, like the data analysis is yeah. still sort of ongoing with that. Um, because we were like, this should really be published because yeah. it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. And to see, do we see that, you know, like if we looked at like Denver or something like that with elevation. Um, and I don't know if he's pursuing that at this point. Yeah. I mean, there's always a lot of interesting stuff in the news, right? About like more depression in places yeah. that are at elevation. And yeah. so there's clearly something about this. I don't know if we know what that is exactly. Um, in medicine, it's really hard to prove cause, right? Like cause and effect. We can prove correlation pretty easily. Like, oh, well, it seems like if you're at elevation, we see more of this happening, but we don't know, you know, if X follows Y. So it's hard to draw really big conclusions from it, except to be like, hmm, yeah. this is kind of interesting, yeah. something we should all pay attention to. It, yeah, right? exactly, exactly. No, great question. Change, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe kind of a narrow topic for an hour to talk about, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. So I guess I would say more than anything, especially spread the word about aura and estrogen, just because I feel like that's the thing that I harp on a lot and change and fix in a lot of things and have been guilty of myself doing. Like I can, I can think of a patient I saw in primary care and I was like, who put you on an estrogen containing birth control? And then it was like, oh, it was me. <laughs> so I've become a lot more emphatic about putting that estrogen in as an allergy. Cause it's just, I mean, we have a system that can help check us from making a very human mistake. So let's just use it to our advantage. And then it's not an issue. In terms of like other insurance coverage, I haven't had a whole lot of pushback from insurers about any of these procedures. I'll often encourage people to check with their insurance before. Um, 
I think the only insurance that I've consistently had pushback about, like birth control in general, is the um, DMBA or the Deseret Mutual Benefits. I don't know what the A stands for, but that's one that even if I've been trying to give people hormones for something like not at all contraception related, um, that they don't want to cover it. So, but otherwise, I would say I have had no issue in getting these covered for contraception, for acne, for migraine, for whatever indication. Mostly with the Affordable Care Act, because that was part of one of the things that should be covered was birth control. So that's been nice in that regard. Although I think interns get, they get to do their own exclusions if they don't want to cover it. Yeah. Yeah, the Paragard is usually, can be a little bit cheaper than the Mirena, sort of depends. Um, because the inserter device is different between the two. Um, and so because the marina was newer, that was a little bit more expensive. So, yeah. And IUDs in general, I will say, are uh, like if you look at women who are in healthcare, it's probably one of the most commonly used forms of birth control of women in healthcare, just because I think we all know about how reliable it is, how easy it is, how much you just don't have to think about it. Um, IUDs in general in the world globally are one of the more commonly used forms of birth control. They're not as common in the United States. And I don't know if that's because of the, um, so it was the 70s with the Dalcon Shield was the one that there were a lot of issues and infertility later. Part of what they, what they changed was so the string on those IUDs is what we call a monofilament or a single string. Um, the ones on the Dalcon shield were abraded, and so there was some thought that for people who got things like gonorrhea or chlamydia, that it was easier for that, um, that bacteria to get in and do something bad. Um, and like I said, now you could have an IUD, you could have chlamydia, and we would just give you antibiotics just like we would do to someone else who wouldn't. So we've definitely come a long way, but for a lot of women, it's their mothers had it and didn't like it, or their, you know, there's usually some sort of family lore to the story, or people just don't talk about it because they don't know about it as an option. Um, so yeah, clearly I'm a bit of an IUD pariah because I walk around with them on my badge. So it's something I talk about a lot. I just one question. I just heard this the other day. What is the risk of an IUD migrating? Yeah, good question. So what is the risk of an IUD either migrating or maybe being not put in the, in the right spot in the first place? So when we put in an IUD, what we do is you have to measure the uterus, and it has to be at least six centimeters, especially with the Paragard and with the Mirena. With the newer ones, they claim you don't. There is no minimum depth, which I'm not really sure how I feel about having like that always been the thing. Um, and so the way we do that is we take this essentially like a long, um, a, a long piece of plastic that has markings on it for centimeters, and you pass that through the cervix until you meet resistance. So this is all a feel thing, right? Like you don't, you're, um, there, some people have tried to use ultrasound. It's pretty hard to see what you're looking at because that uterus is so small and very tucked in the pelvis. So I wouldn't tell you that you're really gritting like incredible visualization of something that's making it a lot easier. Um, so you're feeling for that end point to make sure you get in the right spot. Um, when I consent people for this procedure, the things I always talk about are because I'm doing that and that's a feel thing, there's a chance I could poke a hole in your uterus. Um, what I think is kind of fascinating is if you poke a hole in the body and you know you do it like that, you just give antibiotics and it closes on its own. So you don't have to do anything special about it. Becomes an issue if you don't know you did that. You try to put in the IUD and then you potentially put it in the abdominal cavity. Not effective for contraception. Also just generally not a good thing to have that floating around in your body takes a surgery to get that removed. In terms of malposition, usually an issue for people who've had them in longer than supposed to be. Um, the imaging of choice to look at an IUD in terms of placement is an ultrasound. So I had someone who went to the ER and got a CAT scan for something completely unrelated and they made some comment about the IUD potentially being in the wrong position. So we got an ultrasound and it was totally fine. So like, I, I mean, we don't usually talk about an, what a uterus looks like on a CAT scan. So I think you have to make sure what is the imaging modality of choice. I had a report on someone else who was having pain with their IUD, so we checked to make sure the position was okay. Um, and it said something about one of the arms kind of going into the fallopian tube. And I was out of town, so she like read the report and appropriately was like, well, then I don't want this thing in me anymore and took it out. But when I talked to radiology, they're like, oh, they had these like 3D images that they had, could render and create, and it was totally in the right spot. I think most of it's just, the uterus itself is pretty small. So in terms of like 
migrating, there's not a lot of room for it to go. It's either just not going to be up high enough, it has to be at the top of the uterus, what we call the fundus. If it's sitting too low, you can still get a pregnancy that will implant. I've had that happen to people before. Again, you don't know, is it too low or not? Um, the woman who I had took care of who got pregnant with one and she had the Paragard, so she was having her period every month and she just stopped having her period. So, okay. she, so she was like, I took a pregnancy test and I was pregnant. So then we did an ultrasound to see where it was implanted and then we talked about, okay, well, we're gonna take it out. It looks like you know the, um, the embryo is implanted at the fundus. We know the IUD is too low. We should just be able to pull it out and be fine. There's a risk that this could cause a miscarriage. But if we leave it in, there's a risk that this could actually affect fetal development. So yeah, does that sort of answer your question? I mean, it's always a risk. I wouldn't say it's super common. And probably the bigger issue would be like just not getting it in the uterus in the first place because there's not a lot of there's not a lot of room for it to turn or move or things like that. I've had some where I can't find the strings when I go to take it out, um, and they can sometimes just sort of move up into your cervix a little bit. I've like not seen them on people before, and then had them come back and seen them like the next year when we went to check on it again. I don't have any explanation for why that happens. Um, there's a couple of tools that you can use to try to sort of coax the strings out or sometimes you can, um, if, they're, if the length of their uterus wasn't too long, sometimes you can use a little clamp and you can just happen to grab the bottom of the IUD and get it out. So I've had mixed success with either of those. So I did pretty well for a while and I got all out that I couldn't find strings on and then I had a bunch that I couldn't get out without the strings. So, okay. mm-hmm. One nice thing about IUDs in general, um, they have a really nice, what we call return to fertility. So if you had an IUD in and you wanted to get pregnant, they're probably one of the best in terms of like getting you back on your normal cycle. Um, a lot of people will complain about difficulty getting pregnant after birth control. A lot of women start birth control because their periods were irregular. So yeah, things will get normal when you're on birth control, but when you stop it, you're probably gonna go back to what you were before, and that's really one of your bigger predictors of how easily are you gonna get pregnant. Um, Depo is probably the one that's the worst in terms of return.